messenger, his family, his companions, and all those who follow them in righteousness until the end of time. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome once again to our Thursday program. And just to connect what we talked about two weeks ago, we began talking about more or less the obligations of parents towards their children who are mature, who are at the age of maturity and older. And we mentioned that when our kids come very near to maturity and over, the relationship that the parents have with their children changes significantly. Because now the child is becoming capable of making choices and decisions for, his, for himself or herself. In fact, all of us know it is from puberty or maturity that Allah the Exalted will hold that child responsible for his or her actions. And this is testament to the fact that the child has now reached a stage where he or she is capable is capable of thinking, of making choices, and understanding consequences and reasoning. This is why Allah holds, holds a person accountable from this age. Because now you should be able to understand reason and consequences. Small kids uh, really don't. Although there might be those who are, mashallah, quite smart and intelligent and they understand. So once uh, our kids begin to reach the age where they can understand consequences and they can be reasoned with, our, our responsibilities towards them changes, uh, they change a little bit. And now, there is less forcing, per se, or less decisions that the parents make for their children, and there is more of allowing the child to make his or her choices, to give input, to express his or her views and opinions. Now the child still needs the parent. That's why they continue to live with their parents. Because in as much as they're held accountable for their actions and their choices, they're still not fully capable of living on their own entirely. And so now the responsibility or the role of parents changes into one of being an advisor being a support, being a, a guide, so to speak. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highlights for us in the story of Luqman with his son. We mentioned uh, uh, two verses from this story in Surah Luqman. And what is interesting about this story is that it it does two things for us as parents. One, it tells us what kind of issues we need to be talking to our children about. And two, it tells us the order that we should talk to them about these issues. In other words, there is a number one issue that's, that's priority, that, that's a must, must be talked about first, and then other things later after that. So the kind of issues and the order that we need to talk to them about this. Now we mentioned the first issue that Luqman talked with his son about was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He taught him about God, connected him to God, the Creator. And this is in his statement when he told his son, Ya Bunayya la tushrik billah, do not associate partners with Allah. In this statement, there is the whole issue of Tawheed and Aqeedah that has to be uh, discussed. And then, an important part of our nurturing and training and educating of our children lies in telling them the reason why. As Luqman did with his son here when he said, Inna shirka la azim. Because why you should not associate partners with Allah? The reason is, shirk is the greatest sin. It's the worst sin a person can commit. And this is why 
as Al Imam Bukhari tells us in his Sahih, once when the Prophet ﷺ was asked, Ayyu Dhambi A'zam, which sin is the greatest sin? His reply, he said, An taj'ala lillahi niddam wa huwa khalaqaka. Subhanallah. In his answer, he explains why shirk is really such a great sin. He's, when he was asked which sin is the greatest sin or the greatest sin, he said, to associate a partner or an equal with Allah, while it is Allah alone who created you. Nothing else could ever create anything. So it is Allah the exalted alone who created you. And therefore it is the gravest sin that a person would not recognize that. And how the person does not recognize this? They associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, when he heard the Prophet salam saying this, he said, Inna thalika la Indeed, that is horrible. That is horrible. That is, that a person should associate an equal or a partner with Allah while it is Allah alone who created you. If some other being had created you or helped to create, maybe, maybe, that being may deserve some worship. But the reality is, it is Allah alone who created. So when Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu heard the answer of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, he explained, he said, Inna thalika ma'adhim. Indeed, that is indeed horrible. <clears throat> and then here, there is an interjection as we say in English. Because for the next two verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the responsibility of mature children towards their parents. But we will deal with that separately. And then we go to the next verse in which Luqman continued to advise his son. The second thing he told his son about is, is the accountability before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first thing is about God. Who is God? And all the issues surrounding God, the creator, the sustainer, the controller, and the fact that it is He alone we should worship. And then you go into the details of the different kinds of worship in terms of obedience and love and dua and, and trust and so on. The second issue is that, that Luqman told his son about is the accountability before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he put it over very beautifully. He told his son, Ya Bunayya, innaha in taku min qala habbatim min kharda. O my dear son, if whatever you do should be as tiny as a mustard seed, and again, one of the things you and I can do as parents, as I mentioned last time, is Go to the store, buy a package of, of seeds. If you don't get mustard seed, any seed, or even, you know, these uh, poppy seeds on the bagel. You guys eat bagel? Those tiny black seeds. Just take one and show them. Luqman told his son, if whatever you do should be as tiny as a mustard seed, فَتَكُنْ فِي صَخْرَةٍ Or it should be hidden, and it should be hidden in a rock. Out in Samawat or in the heavens, out in Al or in the earth, Allah will bring it out. Yet TV Allah. So he taught his son one of the most important lessons, and that is to always be conscious of God the Creator. Don't worry about it with anybody else. I mentioned the last time as well that here is where many of us as parents we make the mistake of and of course this is not deliberate, but uh, you know, as our children grow, we keep telling them, don't let, me, don't let me see you do this again. Don't let me hear you say that again. Don't let me catch you do this. What happens after a while, the child grows up thinking that if mom and dad catch us, it's bad, it's not good. But if they don't, it's okay. That's, that's, that's what they understand. That's not what we mean, of course. But nevertheless, this is sort of the, the negative side effect that could occur. But if we, if we train them and we nurture them to be conscious of Allah, who is always present, see the child will know, look, mom and dad are not always around. Excuse me. So they might be tempted, but mom and dad are not around. We can do it and get away with it. Because they said, 
they don't want to hear us saying this. So if they don't hear, it's okay. But if we connect them with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the fact that Allah is always present, which will be covered, by the way, in, 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 in Tawheed, in the first verse, in the first piece of advice. So what happens with the child as he or she grows, is that they are now more likely not to do what is wrong, because they are aware that Allah always sees them. So remind them, you know, constantly we should remind them, think about Allah. You know, sometimes we should tell them, look, don't worry about mom and dad. Don't worry about mom and dad. We won't be around all the time. But think of God, because God is always present. And then after this, so those are the first two issues, Allah, accountability before Allah. And after that, Luqman got into other uh, topics. Ya Munayya, aqim is salah, establish prayers. Now you see what's interesting here, brothers, where prayers come? It comes as number three, in terms of the order here, not as number one. So if you have a child who's not praying or has problems praying, don't force them. Maybe there are defects or confusion about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you need to go back, you know, take a step back and address those confusions first. Once they are addressed, inshallah, prayers will fall into place automatically. If you notice, Luqman did not talk to his son about prayer first. Because the first thing anybody will think is, well, why should I pray? So we need to explain to them. That's what we need to start at the beginning. Look, God created you. God has blessed you with life and blessed you with everything else. And you count it for them. Your toys, your family, your food, your clothing. Because these are things that the children have and they can relate with. You know, ask them, do you have toys? Yes. Well, who gave you the toys? Did you eat today? Yeah. Ask them these questions that they can relate with. And then tell them, look, in the end, we pray to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all these blessings. So, why is important? The third thing is, And don't forget, Speak to, we should speak to our children using good words. Words that convey to them that we love them and we care about them. Luqman said to his son, Ya Bunayya, my dear son. And in this term, Bunayya, he's conveying to his son the high level of concern and love that he has for him. That he really cares about him. That's why he's telling him these things. So we need to avoid calling you know, the children names. I know when we get upset sometimes, uh, we're really upset and, uh, and sometimes we call them names, bad names, but we should try to desist from that. Try to desist from that. Remember, they're children. They don't have the experience that you and I have, so they will make mistakes. It takes many years of practice for many things to just sort of flow easily. But for, for younger people, they haven't had the years of practice. And so yes, there are times when they'll be distracted and so on. So we need to also remember that, to always speak nicely to the children, call, uh, you call them nice names. Aqibis salah, establish prayer. Waqmur bil ma'arufi, wanha'anil munka. My dear son, establish prayers. And again, in as much as uh, uh, Luqman did not go into the details, but you and I should also explain to them why we should pray. And why we should pray five times a day. Why we should pray five times a day. Why not three times a day or once a day. We explain to them the need to always be connected with God Almighty, the Creator. Inshallah, prayer will become easy. Wa'fur bil ma'aruf. Enjoy what is good. Teach them to always encourage their own siblings. Even their own parents, remind their parents to do good things, and in particular their friends, because they spend a lot of time with their friends, and the friends have a lot of influence on them. So here, subhanAllah, if you look at this one statement, وَأْمُرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَنْحَانِ الْمُنْكَرِ Luqman is actually nurturing his son and training him to be a leader, not to be a follower. 
to try to positively influence others, not to be influenced by them, unless of course it's good. So be proactive. You're teaching your child or you should teach your child to be proactive in doing what is good and encouraging others around you to do the same and desisting from what is wrong, one hand in munka, and encourage others around to also avoid that which is wrong. Not because the person is a friend, you turn the blind eye. So you teach the child from a young age to, to, to be proactive, to be a leader, to try to influence people around. We talked, uh, very often we hear about, um, you know, the Muslim is the person who ought to be an asset to the community in which he or she lives. When Islam came on the scene, it influenced society. So much so that, as we say, it changed the course of history. This is the potential of Islam. This is the potential of the message of Islam. So we need to, to, to highlight that for our children, that they should be proactive. Not just do the good, but encourage others to do it. And not just desist from what is wrong, but encourage others to desist. Wasbir ala ma asabak. This, of course, is a very important concept. To have patience, to be steadfast, regardless of what happens to you. Because remember, as, as children, as they're growing, we want them to have sort of a, a good self-esteem, high self-esteem, and to have a positive attitude so that they don't become discouraged easily. This is very good that we, we encourage them and so on, but we need to also prepare them and teach them that they should accept that there are certain things they, they don't control and it may not turn out how they want it to turn out. In fact, even the things they think they could control, it may, it may not turn out the way they want to turn out. And this is why all the social scientists, they always talk about, we, we need to, as parents and elders, we need to prepare our children for failure. We need to encourage them to strive their best to succeed. But at the same time, we also need to prepare them to accept uh, failure sometimes. To accept, look, I'm not always going to be number one. You don't want your child, uh, you know, if the person comes in number two in school, that he or she feels, look, I'm not really good enough. We teach them and we encourage them to strive for excellence and perfection, but we also have to teach them, look, you're always not going to be number one. Sometimes you'll be number two or number three. And that's okay, as long as you do your best. So he told his son, Be patient, be steadfast. You don't need to, to, to give up what you already have because of one failure or because of one trial or hardship that you're faced with. No, be steadfast and be patient. And in talking about sabr, the scholars say that there are three types of, 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 of sabr. There is a sabr fi ta'atillah. Steadfastness in the worship of Allah. In order to, to perform our ibadat and our wajibat, our obligations, we need steadfastness, we need, uh, we need determination. That is also sabr. Because sabr in Arabic language is habsul nafs or imsaqul nafs. It is to control the self, the urge or the desire. So in order to pray, for example, in order to fast, Ramadan is going to start soon, inshallah, it takes a lot of, of steadfastness to pray and to fast. Why? Because there are many times when you may not feel like praying now. So it takes that control of the self to go and do your prayer because Allah has ordered this. And this is how you show submission to Allah. So there is a sabr fi ta'atillah. Patience or steadfastness in obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then there is a sabr an ma'asiyatillah. There is a, a, a type of patience or control, if you like, in not disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, that takes control. Because disobedience usually are things that people enjoy, they find pleasure in. So there is a, a desire or a will to do it. 
And perhaps this is, this is very difficult to control. So it takes patience, it takes steadfastness, it takes control to control that. And then the third type of sabr is the sabr in the in the masai. It's the patience and the steadfastness that a person should display when they're faced with difficulties. When they're faced with difficulties. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is in control of the universe. And you see, brothers and sisters, this is the beauty. This is why Luqman told his son about Allah first before he tells him about some. Because in teaching the child about Allah, inevitably you have to teach them all the details. That Allah is the Rabb. What does Rabb mean? He's the creator, the sustainer, and the controller, the mutasarraf. He controls everything. So that a human being may want, may desire one thing, but God Almighty may will something else. And it is the will of God that will happen, that will be established. Not my will or your will. I have to teach them that. So that when they're faced with difficulties, they know this is not the end of the world. They know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in control. And our duty as Muslims is to submit what Allah has decreed. This is why the Prophet والسلام, he tells us in the, in the hadith in the sahih, that all the affairs of the believer are good for him. Anything that happens to a believer is good for him. The Prophet says, if good things happen to the person, because everything that happens is either good or bad. Right? Something you, you good you consider good, or something you consider bad or difficult, something you don't like. If good happens to him, he is grateful. The Prophet says, he is grateful, and that is best for him. Being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because it is with gratitude, brothers and sisters, that not only will the blessings remain, but they will be increased, as Allah tells us in the Quran. And remember when your Lord announced your decree, if you are grateful, if you show gratitude and you give thanks, I will increase you. And the Prophet says, and if bad happens to the person, to the believer, he is patient and steadfast, submits to what Allah has decreed, does not question the wisdom of Allah, the exalted, does not display any rebellion or dislike for what Allah has decreed. You know, people say, why did this have to happen to me? What did I do to deserve this? This is not fair. No, these are statements that imply rebellion and dislike of what Allah the Exalted has decreed. This is not submission. And that's why when, uh, when the Prophet's son, Ibrahim, he was, Ibn Kathir said, uh, about 18 months old, he passed away in Medina. In fact, he, he died as the Prophet ﷺ held him in his own hands. And tears flowed from the eyes of the Prophet ﷺ, and he said, "Inna al-qalba yahsan, inna al-ayna, inna al-ayna tadma, wal-qalba yahsan. Surely the eyes shed tears, and the hearts grieve. Wa inna lifiraqika ya Ibrahimu la mahzunun. And surely, O Ibrahim, and here he's addressing his son who just died." Surely with your departure, we're saddened. If your child dies, someone close to you dies, you're sad. But then the Prophet ﷺ said, وَلَا نَقُولُ إِلَّا مَا يُرْضِي رَبَّنَا This is the, this is the sabr here. And, but we will not say anything except that which pleases our Lord. So you have to have the control. Not to say anything that, that, that implies rebellion and dislike for what Allah has decreed. So the Prophet ﷺ said that the affairs of the believer, of the Muslim, all of it is good for him. Whether it's good, it's good that happens to him or bad. If good happens, he's thankful and this is best for him. And if bad happens, he's patient and steadfast and that's best for him. Because no matter how much brothers and sisters we rebel and we jump, 
and we, we make noise, we cannot change anything. We cannot change. The only thing we can control is our behavior, our reaction. Nothing else. So if the glass is already broken, no matter how much we quarrel, it will not get fixed. It's already broken. So really, if we think about it, it really doesn't make sense for a person to lose their cool and yell and scream when something bad happens to them. Because it's useless. It's useless. So Luqman also told his son, he prepared him for failures in life, or for difficulties in life, not necessarily failures per se, but difficulties. And as much as we want them to succeed and to always excel, they need to learn that, look, life is not always like this. It's not always up. Sometimes they're downs. And you have to embrace the down, be patient, and inshallah, it will change. You teach them that situations in life do not always stay the same. They, they, they fluctuate, as we say, or they revolve. That's why sometimes we're happy, and then other times we're sad. We're not always happy all the time. We're not always sad all the time. So these fluctuations, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created these things so that, number one, people can appreciate the opposites. So by becoming uh, sad, a person can appreciate being happy. By becoming ill, a person can appreciate being healthy. By becoming hungry, a person can appreciate having food to eat, mashallah. So with the opposites, things become clear. And these uh, are the fluctuations that Allah has decreed so that a person is not, no person ever faces the same situation all his or her life. So nobody is always happy all the time or always sad all the time. It's up and down. And we have to teach them that. And then he tells his son, إِنَّ ذَٰلِكَ لَمِنْ عَزْمِهُمُ Surely that, and some of us say that he refers to sabr. Being patient when you are faced with difficulties. Inna dhalika, surely that, that is being patient. La min azmi umur. It is being patient. It is it's from those things that take form resolve. It's not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing. It takes form resolve. It takes strong control. It takes dedication and commitment to be in control and not to lose your cool and to be patient and steadfast. And some of the Mufassirun say Dhalika here refers to the four things that were mentioned before. As salah, uh, enjoying what is good, or right, forbidding what is wrong, and being patient. All these four, these are the things that Lamin Asmi they take form resolve to carry out. Then he went on to also talk to his son some more. And here he teaches his son certain attitudes. One of the biggest problems we have with young people today is their attitude. Uh, very often they're rude or there is pride or arrogance in their attitude. You know, there is this uh, tendency for them to sort of look down on others. So it's important that we deal with their attitude as well. So he tells his son, now this is an expression that is used to, 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 to imply pride and arrogance. Because literally, if one person feels better than someone else, when they pass that person, they will turn away. They will think that person is not even worth looking at. So this is where the turning away of the cheek comes from, that literal expression. So he tells the son, don't turn your face away from people. That is, don't, don't, be so, don't feel superior to people. Don't be proud and arrogant. You think that somebody is not worth looking at them. In other words, be humble. And don't walk on, in the earth or on the earth with arrogance and pride. So don't turn away your cheek because you feel superior to someone. 
or you think you're better than anyone, no. Be friendly to everyone. Humble yourself. And do not walk about on the earth with arrogance and pride. For surely, Allah does not love the arrogant and boastful person. Now here, we need to tell them a little bit about pride, what it is, and why it's so, why is it such a horrible sin? And this is the right time that we share with them the story of Satan, Shaitan, and his refusal to obey Allah's command. When Allah created Adam salam and ordered everyone present at the time, most of them, of course, they were all angels except one jinn, Iblis. And everyone, all the angels frustrated except Iblis. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked him, Ya Iblis, ma mana'aka an tasjuda idh amartuk. O Iblis, what prevented you? What held you back from prostrating when I ordered you to? His answer was, قَالَ أَنَا خَيْرٌ مِّنْهُ خَلَقْتَنِي مِنْ نَارٍ وَخَلَقْتَهُ مِنْ تُرِينَ He says, I'm better than him. So this is the pride. And because of this pride, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered him to go out of paradise. Because when he displayed this pride and arrogance, Allah says to him, قَالَ فَخْرُجْ مِنْهَا فَمَا يَكُونُ لَكَ أَنْ تَتَكَبَّرَ فِيهَا Allah says, said to, to Shaitan, Ukhruj, get out from here. For it is not befitting of you to be proud in here, in paradise. That is. So we have to teach them about their attitude. And in particular, to avoid being proud and arrogant and feeling better or superior to others. And we tell them why. And then, in addressing their attitude and behavior again, Luqman said to his son also, Waqsid fi mashikar, waqdud min sawtik. Alright, subhanAllah, four things, or four points, that deal with the attitude of the individual. Wala tusamir khaddaka linnas. Don't turn your cheek away from people or your face. Wala tamshi fil abdi maraha. That's two. The third thing is, Waqsid fi mashikar. Be moderate in the way you walk. Be gentle. And again, the implication here is avoid any form of or display of pride and arrogance or superiority in the way you walk. Be moderate, humble. Waqdud min sawti. Lower your voice. You don't have to shout, you don't have to raise your voice. Then he tells them why he shouldn't raise his voice. For surely the most annoying voice is the voice or the brain of the donkey. When it breaks, it's very annoying because it's loud. It's very loud and it hurts your ears. There's no need for that. So to get your point across, you don't need to shout and scream. You can do so in a, in a calm tone, in a gentle manner. And this is why the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, subhanAllah, I mean, depending on the nature of the occasion, sometimes uh, his voice would raise, and sometimes it would be low. But the raising of his voice would not reach the level where you and I would classify his shouting and scream. Because again, shouting and screaming really indicates that this person has gotten very angry to the point where he or she is not able to be objective. To the point where he or she will not be able to hear what the other person is saying. So the idea is not just to speak loudly, not just not to speak loudly, but really to also be calm, listen to what other people have to say. Listen to what they have to say. You may disagree with them in the end. You don't have to agree with them, but at least they're entitled to their opinion. There's no need to shut them down, as if to shut them up. 
So, this, brothers and sisters, is the list of the topics and the issues that Luqman spoke to his son about. And as you notice, there is a certain order. And it doesn't mean, of course, that there, there, there aren't other issues we should talk to our children about. Because each one of these issues mentioned in this surah, of course, will encompass other issues as well. But they form the basis, if you like, or the guideline for you and I, as our children hit maturity and beyond, how we should deal with them and interact with them. Now is the time when we need to talk with them, reason with them, advise them, be a bit firm, but allow them more space. Don't treat them like they're six or seven years old. But constantly let them know that you are simply concerned about their safety and their well-being. Because many young people, whenever they ask parents to go out with friends or to go here or to go there, and the parents refuse, eventually they, they, they begin to think that the parents simply want to restrict them from doing things. The parents want to restrict them from enjoying themselves. That's how they view it. So it's important that, that the parents reinforce with, with their children that, look, we're not doing this because we don't want you to have fun and we don't want you to be happy. We want you to be happy, we want you to have fun, but we're also responsible for you. If anything happens to you, the police will come to us first, right? So we need to tell them this as well. Remind them that as parents, you are the ones who are responsible for them and that you are always concerned about their safety and their well-being. And this is why you are reluctant sometimes to let them go with friends or let them go to certain places. So that they learn that their parents care for them and they're worried about them in as much as they may think sometimes that you don't have to be worried about us. Rather than them growing up thinking, oh, my parents don't love me, they don't, they don't want me to have fun. They just want me to stay home all the time, that's it. No. So, as you can see, brothers and sisters, once they hit maturity and after that, this is the time when we should do it. So now, they have the mental capacity to understand reasoning and to be reasoned with. And in any case, in any case, forcing them is not really the answer. Forcing them is not the answer. And when I say force, if they want to do something that's wrong, then of course you have to stand for. That's not forcing them. To do anything. That's letting them letting them clearly know up front that there is no way you will allow them to do what is wrong. 